Romans 5 and Romans 6. Um, okay, the recording is started. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, any questions so far on Romans 5 and Romans 6, what we have covered uh, before we step into Romans 7? Hi, Pastor. Uh, I have a, um, a question. So um, this is regarding uh, from Romans chapter 6, uh, right? So uh, when, when I first read this chapter many, many years ago, you know, I understood, uh, you know, my my head understands that, you know, when we, when we were dead with Jesus Christ, we were crucified with him and we were raised with him. And so uh, sin can't really uh, have any hold over us, or you know. Um, so there was a time where I understood that logically. And uh, and then if I were to explain it to, uh, say, a young person, uh, you know, again, they might understand the words that it says, but so how do I explain it in a way uh, that it impacts their spirit, uh, you know, like, um, where it goes beyond just words and logic? Uh, mm. I hope I made sense. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think, I think the, um, the starting point is for us to come to understand that this is uh, truth, that this is truth. And uh, therefore we can walk in the truth. Right, so that means, um, they need to understand, the, the spirits need to grasp, hey, this is truth. This, what God is telling me is truth. And therefore, I can walk in this truth. Right? So we look at this whole explanation of identification and the outcome, the consequences of identification. And this, uh, people need to accept this, hey, this is truth. And when that gets into the heart, like, yeah, sin will not control me. Sin doesn't have, to, I don't have to be a slave to sin because of this these reasons, what I've seen. Uh, then, it, you know, that's the first thing. Because otherwise, as believers, we think, oh man, I'm going to be struggling with this, struggling with sin all my life, or I'm going to be in bondage to sin or whatever. But the truth, when we uh, accept this as truth. This is the truth. This is what God said. Then I can walk in it. And uh, it can become my experience. I think that's the key here. And uh, that revelation has to come. Uh, something that the Holy Spirit has to bring into their hearts. So we can try and communicate it as simply, as plainly as uh, possible. Uh, but that it has to grip their hearts, you know, that, hey, this is true, that, that the Holy Spirit has to do it. Is that... Uh, yes, Pastor, yes. Yeah, yes. Thank you, Pastor. Kind of, uh, you know, because uh, I think that's what makes a lot of difference for, you know, for, for anything that we see in the Bible. That uh, yeah, if the if our hearts are gripped with it, that this is truth, I'm I'm going to have it. Then uh, we're able to step into it. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Any other questions from anybody else? Any any other thoughts? Everyone's okay. All right. So. Now we're going to go into Romans chapter seven, all right? In uh, just to give a yeah, thank you. I, I see the comments on the chat. Okay, uh, just to give a little gist uh, of Romans seven before we read it. So, like we said, Paul realizes he comes. I mean, in in, in Romans six, okay, flesh, and um, that has to be addressed. So when you come into Romans 7, uh, you will find Paul using the word law uh, quite often. He talks about the law, which 
is the law as in the Old Testament law, the law with a capital L, referring to the law of Moses, the Old Testament law. But he also uses the word law in the context of sin, the law of sin. Uh, talking about the control of sin, right? So as we read Romans 7, we will see the word law used in both terms. One is referring to the law as in the Old Testament law, the commandments. The other one is the law of sin, as in the control of sin, the dominion of sin that we have to uh, deal with. Now, Romans 7 has been a, quite a challenging chapter for students, for people who study the Bible, because it is not, I mean, the, the, the question, the big question is, uh, okay, Paul is referring to himself. He says, I, 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 you know, so you'll find as we read through, talking about himself. But what is not very obvious, so not very clear in Romans 7, is that, is he talking about himself before he was saved or after he was saved? Or even after he was saved, was he talking about him, okay, he was saved and still struggling in the flesh? Or, you know, where was Paul in his spiritual journey when he's referring to himself here in Romans 7? That's a big question mark. And so when you read different Christian books, uh, the authors will take their, you know, they will explain Romans 7 from that perspective, their own, from the pres um, their presumption of a certain position, meaning, okay, uh, Paul is talking about him as maybe a new believer, he's struggling like this, or he's talking about the life of every believer forever on this earth. So that could be another position people take. That means uh, what they're trying to say from Romans 7 is uh, you're a believer, but for the rest of your life, you're going to be struggling with sin. But for me, and I'm not forcing this idea on you, but uh, for me, I'm convinced from Romans 7, and as, as you read it, you, you look at it for yourself. I'm convinced Paul is talking about himself as an unsaved person under the law. He's talking about his struggles as a good man, still unsaved, living under the law. Whereas when we jump into Romans 8, he's talking about his salvation and the life in Christ. So therefore, in my understanding, as we read Romans 7, Whatever is being said in Romans 7 does not apply to the believer. It applies to somebody, in this case Paul, who was not saved yet, but he was a good man, but he was living under the law. And it shows the struggle of any person who is trying to live right, but does not have the life of God in him, does not have the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. So that's my understanding. That's the way I, you know, I uh, understand Romans 7 and I uh, explain it and live it and believe it. Uh, but I just want to be, uh, I want to make us aware that different Bible teachers and others will, 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 will see it differently. Because it's, uh, although for me, I feel it's very quite clear that Paul is referring to himself as uh, in Romans 7 as while he was under the law, some people may position it differently and say, well, uh, this is the struggle of every believer throughout the rest of their life, which I think does not hold just because he has already told us in Romans 6, the power of sin is broken and sin will not have dominion over us. And uh, we, you know, in Romans 8, he says there is victory. So um, Romans 7 cannot be the experience of a believer for the rest of their lives. It's that of a person who's under the law, who does not have the power of the Holy Spirit, but who has a good heart and who, who wants to do good, okay? So those are some of the things that I just wanted to say as we begin to read Romans 7, okay? Uh, so let's read the first six verses, please. Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. Somebody could read that for us. Okay. 
have with the person. Or do you not know present? For I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then if while we while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who has raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. For we, when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were arose by the law were at work in our member to bear fruit to death. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to when we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so what can we see here in these first six verses? First, from verse one, we can see that he's addressing Jewish believers, right? Uh, he says, uh, do you not know brethren? I speak to those who know the law. So obviously these had to be Jewish people, not the Gentiles, uh, because the Gentiles would not have known the law. So he's writing to Jewish believers. And now, why do you say believers? He's referring to them as brethren. So that's uh, indi indicative that he's referring to believers. So it says, Jewish brethren, uh, I, I'm writing to you. In the first six verses, he's establishing the fact that life has changed after, uh, from before and after. Before, they were under the law. When, were that, when was that? Before they came to Christ, oh, of course. So before, these Jewish brethren were under the law. But now he's still trying to impress on them, help, help them understand they are free from the law. And to help them understand this is using the analogy of a woman, uh, of a wife. As long as her husband is alive, she's, you know, by law, uh, she's bound to her husband. But if the husband dies, she's free to marry somebody else. So he's, he's using that analogy. And then he says, brethren, I want you to know. So remember, he's, right, he's speaking to Jewish brethren, people who know the law. He says, I want you to know, verse 4, uh, you've become dead to the law. How? Through the body of Christ. So this is the shift that has taken place. They were without the body. They were outside the body of Christ. Now they're in the body of Christ. They're in Christ. So. When they were out of the body of Christ, they were under the law. But now they are in the body of Christ. Or like he uses the phrase, you are married to another because the law is dead. As far as the Jew believer is concerned, the law is dead. It's over. It's gone. And now they are in the body of Christ and they are married to Christ. Right? So he's using that analogy. So... Then verse 5 and 6, it says, when we were in the flesh. So not when, not the life of the believer now, but when you are in the flesh, living the past life, the sinful life. The sinful passions aroused by the law, that means they were highlighted by the law, right? Meaning it was a law that said, do not steal, do not kill, do not commit adultery, do not covet. So if there was no law, then these passions would have like, it may look like very normal. Everybody's doing it, I'm also doing it. But when it was seen in the light of the law, then they realized, hey, these are wrong. So these sinful passions were at work in our members and it only resulted in death. 
verse 6 but now you are delivered from the law so again i want uh, this is again indicative of the life without christ when you are under the law living bound by sinful passions that were highlighted by the law but now you're delivered from the law where are you now you're in the body of christ you're married to another so you're delivered from the law and we are living in the newness of the spirit not in the oldness of the letter so this is one reason why i am quite convinced i'm convinced that he's contrasting these two lives the life under the letter of the law, under the oldness of the letter, and the life that is in the newness of the spirit. He's contrasting that. The life under law, the life in the body of Christ, married to Christ in the newness of the spirit. But the main point in these six verses is trying to get these Jewish believers to understand we are not subject to the law anymore. We are free from the law because now we are in the body of Christ. We are serving God in the newness of the Spirit, right? Or if you want to cross-reference in Galatians 5 and verse, um, Galatians 5 verse 18, uh, sorry, yeah, verse 18, Galatians 5, 18, he says, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not, under the law Galatians 5 verse 18 if you're led by the spirit you're not under the law why because the holy spirit is going to keep help us do the law and much more than the law right he's going to bear the fruit of love joy peace kindness meekness temperance uh, faithfulness gentleness temperance against which there is no law and the law is not cannot speak against this cannot hold us against this right so when you walk in the spirit, you're not under the law, right? So that's why Romans 6, 6, Romans 7, verse 6, we are in the newness of the spirit, not under the oldness of the letter of the law. Okay, so he's telling the believer, Jewish believers, don't have to live by the law, you're walking in newness of the spirit. But then he now goes into talking about the law, and the struggle with sin. Okay, so let's go from verse 7, uh, Romans chapter 7, or 7 to 12, please. Romans 7, 7 to 12, please. Start, do you want to read that? Can I go ahead? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetousness, covetous desire. For apart from law, sin is dead. Once I was alive apart from law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me and through the commandment put me to death. So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. Mm -hmm. So, in these verses, Paul is addressing the whole aspect of the law. So, you know, he has just gone through telling the Jewish believers, look, we're not under the law, we're free from the law, we're in the body of Christ, we are married to another, uh, we are serving God in the newness of the Spirit, all of that so then obviously the next question again rhetorical question oh so uh, is the law sinful 
In other words, is there a problem with the law? So he says, obviously, certainly not, right? So he, he keeps asking these questions as he's explaining things. So the problem is not with the law. In fact, like he, he, he concluded in verse 12, the law is holy. It's uh, the commandment is holy. It's just and good, meaning the law is good. Nothing wrong with the law. You know, the law tells us not to kill, not to steal, not to uh, covet, not to do all these things. The law is good. The law is holy. The law is just. So the problem is not with the law. The problem is, he says, look, when because of the law, sin became very powerful. That means I now knew there was something called sin. And not only that, I then realized I couldn't be free from this thing. So the law highlighted my weakness against sin, is what he's saying. Again, in this passage, there's a very interesting verse, which is verse 9, which, again, you'll find different people interpreting this verse differently or understanding this verse differently. He says, I was alive once without the law. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So this has been a challenging verse for many. When what Paul is of course referring to himself but when was he in this state where he said, I was alive once without law? And then when commandment came, sin revived and I died. You know, how do we understand this verse uh, you know, correctly to the best of our understanding? I mean, the best person to tell us this would, of course, be the Apostle Paul. And, you know, say, hey, what were you, what were you really referring to when you said, I was alive without the law? And uh, of course, the Holy Spirit today will have to help us understand, you know, what what is actually being said. Um, so let's look at it. Paul, look at Paul's life. At what stage or when would this have been true? When he was alive without the law, but when commandment came, sin revived, and I died. So. Before coming to know the law, because he says, when the commandment came, that means when he received understanding of the commandment. So up until that time, he was not under the law, I mean, in the sense that he didn't know how you know, to submit, what, is, what should he submit himself to. So he was without the law in that sense. And when he was without the law, that means he still, he didn't have the understanding of the law. What is good, what's good and bad, what's right and wrong. He was without the law. He said, I was alive. So, this was before his knowledge of the law. He was alive. So again, here's something interesting to think about. Again, I, I don't want to say this, you know, as though this is um, like definitive, but it seems to be indicative that there's this age, maybe we don't know exactly which, uh, you know, maybe 12 or 13, or at some point when as a, as a person, we understand the commandment, meaning this is right and this is wrong. And I know that as children growing up, we tell them, don't do this, do this. And, you know, we, we help them understand and they, of course, to understand. But, uh, you know, the term, the age of accountability, that means they, they, they come to this place where they understand the big picture, they see the big picture. There is God, 
And it's not just about obeying mom and dad or, you know, if I do this, I will get a chocolate. And if I don't do this, I will not get a chocolate. It's not about that. But they come to the place where they understand commandment as having to do with God. What exact that age is, I guess it would vary from person to person. Some people may at a young age come to that understanding of commandment. And some may be a little later, but generally people say around 12, 13 or something. So it seems, verse 9 seems to indicate that stage, that transition. He was alive once without the law. I didn't have understanding of the law. I was alive, just free. But when the commandment came, an understanding of the law came, that I am held accountable to this standard, then sin came alive and I died. That means I had no way to overcome sin. Sin took a hold of me. So that's what he says there in verse 8. Sin taking opportunity by the commandment. That means when the understanding of the commandment came, sin, the awareness of sin came. Because what is sin? It is a violation of the law. It is a breaking of the commandment. So the understanding of sin came. And I saw what was, what was sin doing. It was producing in me all manner of evil, desire. So I saw that in, hey, actually, in me, there are all kinds of wrong desires which are contrary to the law, which is sin, right? And so what he's telling us in these uh, verses seven to 12, he's talking about the law and he's talking about sin. And in essence, he says that, you know, only when the law was presented to me, I realized I was sinning. Not only did I realize I was sinning, I also realized something more. I realized that there was sin at work in me. That means there was all manner of evil desire in me. which was causing me to break the law or causing me to sin. So now as we progress, you'll find that he now focuses on not just the law, but on the sin in me, the sin, sinful desires, the evil desires that were in the person. Okay. So we pick up in verse 13 and uh, yeah, let's just read, uh, I guess we'll just read the, uh, till verse 25, okay? Uh, Romans chapter 7, 13 to 25, and we'll go through those verses together. Romans uh, 7, uh, 7 to 35. Well, then I am suggesting that the law of God is sinful. Of course not. In oh, fact, sorry. Uh, 13 to 25, please. 13 onwards, uh, Thomas. Okay, Pastor. But how can that be did the law which is good caused by death of course not sin used what was good to bring about my condemnation to death so we can see how terrible sin really is it uses god's good commands for its own evil purpose so the trouble is not with the law for it is spiritual and good the trouble is with me for i am all too human a slave to sin I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what is what I hate. But if I know that what I'm doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I'm not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that dies it. And now that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature, I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do that what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to, to do, I'm not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me 
that does it. Yeah, verse 21 to 25. I have discovered this principle life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart. But there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still with me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you see how it is in my in my mind. I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I'm slave to sin. Hmm. So these verses, thank you, Thomas. Verses 13 to 25, Paul describes the struggle. So he has said, look, the law has highlighted sin. But the problem is not with the law. The law is good, it's holy, it's spiritual, it's righteous and just. But there's sin, and there's a sin working in my flesh through my natural desires, which have now our flesh, meaning that are now evil desires, natural evil desires. So as you look at these verses very carefully, you see there's a struggle there. He says, look, I want to do what's right, but I don't do it. I desire to please God, but I don't do it. And why is it? Because I find, verse 21, I find a law. I find something that is controlling me. It is the evil that is present with me. And this evil, verse 23, is you know, keeping my members enslaved to sin, even though in my inner person, my mind, I want to obey God. So verse 24, who's going to deliver me from this body of death? Why is he calling it a body of death? Because sin pro produces death, verse 13. Sin produces death. So, his body has now become the body of death. Why? Because it's controlled by sin. And therefore, the, the more he's going to let sin dominate him, his body is going to, you know, things that produce death are at work in his body. So the big question, like I mentioned at the very beginning, the big question many people try to answer is like, is Paul referring to, like, is this descriptive, verses 13 to 25, is this descriptive of Paul as a believer? Is this descriptive of Paul as a man under the law before becoming a believer? That's the big question. And a lot of Christians quote this passage, verses 13 to 25, uh, to describe their struggle against sin. Say, so, okay, you know, Paul also struggled and I'm also struggling. I want to do good, but I don't do it. But I want to, you know, point out a couple of things. First of all, Paul is talking about him while he was under the law. He started off like after he explained that we are free from the law, he then goes back and says, okay, let's, is the law wrong? Oh, while we were under the law, while I was under the law, this is what I found. So he has already transitioned or positioned this whole experience as while I was under the law. We saw that in verse nine, when the commandment came, that means when I came to know the law, Sin came up and I was died. I died. So that's one thing that is, he's already positioned what he's going to say as, while I was under the commandment, while I was under the law, this was my experience. Secondly, he concludes this whole thing by saying, thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, meaning, I'm pointing to the way out. I feel trapped, but this is the way out. He's not saying, I took the way out, 
came on the other side and I found myself trapped. Now, I was under the law and I'm trapped because I want to do the right things which the law is telling me but I'm finding sin controlling my flesh, my body. How can I get rid of the sin that is controlling my desires, controlling my fleshly desires? How can I get rid of it? He points to the way out. Jesus Christ is the way out. So that's the second reason why I say this experience of verse 13 and 13 to 25 does not apply to the believer because the believer is on the other side. But it is an experience, it is Paul's experience while under the law before coming to Jesus Christ. Right? Now, I, I recognize that some people may not see it the way I just shared, but this is my conviction. And uh, I am sharing that with you. Now, if you, you know, after studying Romans 7, you know, you're free to take the position that you're comfortable with from your understanding, you know, from your study. Um, but these are two reasons why I, I, you know, I'm really convinced that Romans 7, 13 to 25 is talking about Paul's life as a good Jewish person, but without the power of Jesus Christ in his life. And so Paul is saying, verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ. So there are two things that need to be dealt with. The law has already been dealt with. We are dead to the law, we are married to Christ, done. But there is the law of sin and there's a law of death. So he says, and you find this, you know, uh, uh, there is, uh, in verse 9, he says, and just follow me here, uh, Romans 7, verse 9, he says, sin revived, I died. So, sin and death. Verse 13, sin producing death. Because the wages of sin is death, or the result of sin is death. Sin is producing death. Death means anything that is decaying, that, that destroys, that corrupts, and ultimately it is physical death and spiritual death. It's sin producing death. Verse 17, sin dwells in me. Verse 23, the law of sin, which is in my members, that means the control of sin in my body. What is the result? Verse 24, this body of death, that means sin dwelling in my body is causing my body to die. Again, the end of verse 25, the law of sin. So what I've pointed out in these verses is there are, Paul is saying there are two problems here. There is sin and death. There's the law of sin and death because sin is producing death in me. So who's going to set us free from the sin that is controlling my flesh, the desires of my body, and is ultimately producing death in me. It's causing my body to die. Things that are destructive to my body. That's the problem. Who's going to deliver me? How am I going to come out of this? Now, why is this important? In the light of what Paul has already said in Romans 6, there's one connecting point. What is it? Romans 6, 19. I'm speaking to you because of the weakness of your flesh. So there's a weakness in the flesh. In the believer, what is it? Sin is at work in the flesh. Right? And sin is producing death. So sin, if it's allowed to continue in the flesh, will still produce death. So while the believer has uh, is set free, how does he walk free? from sin that produces death in the flesh. And that takes us into chapter eight. Okay, that's the answer. The answer is there in chapter eight. So remember he's, he's writing it you know, in one continuous flow of thought and uh, chapter eight is going to tell us how the believer 
can live free from sin. So let me pause here. Any questions so far on Romans 7? Okay. Um, is it clear? Is Romans 7 clear? Anybody else with any? Okay. I'm just looking at the chat and I see your responses there. Okay. Anyone else? Any questions? Thomas, Dave, Conan, Sadat, Prince. Okay. So we've come to this point. And in Romans 8, he, uh, and this is just a preview, we'll pick this up next week. He says, okay, what's the answer? Thank God through Jesus Christ. So now he's transitioning. I've come to experience and encounter Jesus Christ. So in Christ, how can I overcome this sin that controls my flesh and the sin that is producing death in me? What is the answer? We find that right there in Romans chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. It says, there is now, therefore now, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So you see the transition. It's a change now. What is it? I'm I'm in Christ Jesus. And in Christ, I'm not living according to the flesh, but I'm living according to the Spirit. Why? Because the Spirit has made me free from the law of sin and death. What was working in me? Sin and death. Who set me free? I'm in Christ, and in Christ, the Holy Spirit set me free from sin and death. Right? So, this Romans 8, 1 and 2 is where the believer should be living. You understand the truth of Romans 6. You practice those instructions in Romans 6. And then you live in Romans 8. The spirit of life enables us to overcome law or the law of sin and death, the control of sin and death in our bodies. Okay. So we're going to pick this up next week. Uh, Romans chapter 8 and uh, we'll uh, get into this it's exciting uh, because this is like the answer this is where the believer is supposed to be living uh, in Christ okay so um, we'll pause here let's close in prayer and then we will dismiss can somebody please close in prayer and we will dismiss the class Siddharth, you want to pray? Or, sorry, Roshan, go ahead. Okay. Father, we thank you uh, for this time, Lord. We thank you once again for this wonderful opportunity uh, that we have to uh, uh, get to learn from your word, Lord. Uh, Father, as your word says in Psalm 19, I pray that you will open up our eyes to the wonderful things of your word as we study, Father. Uh, we commit the rest of the day into your hands. You continue to guide us, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. And, uh, Thank you, Pastor. We'll see you again. Thank you. Bye now. Thank Bye you, now. sir. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you.